The time is 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and that means it's time for us to begin our monthly webinar today. And the topic is Little Known Wireless Analysis Tools. Now, I don't hope to surprise you here, but all of the tools we look at today will not be specifically wireless tools because we have to remember that as wireless professionals, we're not just working with layer one and layer two. So I'll be showing you some little known tools for analysis and forensics investigation and things like that that are above at higher layers as well, just so that you can be exposed to those. But whether we capture the traffic on the wireless side or the wired side, we often need to analyze application level data and things like this as well. So it's good to know about some of these different tools that are available out there that you may not be aware of. Now before we get into the agenda for the day and what we're going to be talking about, let me just point out my name is Tom Carpenter. I'm the CTO here at CWNP and we do these monthly webinars in order to just give you some information about the wireless industry, give you information about different tools and technologies, about our certifications and so forth in order to keep you informed as best as we can. And today, of course, we're looking at wireless analysis or general network analysis as the tool applies. Some of them will be specific to wireless that we'll be taking a look at. And we are very excited about the fact that we have big things going on at CWNP and we'll be sharing information about that at WLPC next week. So um, if you're not able to attend, you'll want to make sure you watch the videos when the very good folks at WLPC post those online. And if you've not heard of WLPC, it's the Wireless Land Professionals Conference. You can, of course, find more online about that. So if you're going to be there, I look forward to seeing you next week. If not, I look forward to hopefully seeing you at our conference later in the year this October. So what is the agenda that we're talking about today? Well, the good news is it's demo, demo, demo. We're just going to be looking at a lot of tools, and this will be the last slide that we see in today's webinar. And so we're going to be demonstrating different Windows, Linux tools, and I'll show you a website that has some hardware that I've noticed a lot of people are not familiar with existing at a very low-cost entry point for wireless analysis. So first of all, uh, on the Windows side, we're going to be looking at a tool called Net Surveyor Professional. Now this actually comes from the people that sell the hardware we'll be talking about at the end at nutsaboutnets.com. And Net Surveyor Professional is an interesting different take on looking at your wireless network. Or it's a different take on tools like Insider and things like that. It gives you a little different information. So we'll take a look at that. We're going to look at Network Miner. This is one of those tools that whether I'm capturing on a wireless interface, it's say a public hotspot or something like that, or if I'm capturing on my wired side of my AP where there's no encryption, whatever, I'm able to actually do some real forensics analysis, look at communication chains, things like this that are going on, very powerful. We'll look at the Device Monitoring Studio, which is another very interesting take on how to see what's going on with our wireless network. We'll see Explico, which is actually an online uh, PCAP analyzer, and Acrylic Wi-Fi Professional. Then when we look at Linux, we'll look at CAP Analysis. Now you can use CAP Analysis in a web browser from a Windows computer, but if you're running it as a server, it runs on Linux. So we'll look at it from within Linux, but we don't actually have it installed on Linux. You'll want to install it, get it up and running to have your own server if you're going to use CAP Analysis. But we'll look at its online interface so you can see how that works. We'll take a look at Scappy. Um, many people have not seen this tool. Scappy is an interactive network analysis query tool that is in Linux, available in Linux. And it runs on Ubuntu, it runs on Kali Linux, things like this. And a very, very useful tool. Then we'll see that we can actually use the network miner uh, in Linux and take a look at that as well. And finally, we'll wrap up by looking at, as I said, some RF hardware that you may not have heard of before that's available at nutsaboutnets.com. So with that, we want to begin looking at some demonstrations. So the first tool we're going to look at here is Network or Net Surveyor Pro. And in order to do that, I need to make sure that I've connected all of my adapters to some interfaces here. So we'll go ahead and connect to one here. A Wi-Fi 3 is already connected.
See if we can get these adapters up and running here. The joy of running multiple adapters. Okay, so we'll connect here. We'll connect here. And we'll connect here. And now that all of our adapters are connected, we'll run NetServer Pro. Now this tool is, as I said, a little different take and uh, on the different ways that you can view your wireless networks. And you can see I'm seeing uh, three different captures here. Um, channel 1 or adapter 1, adapter 2, and adapter 4. My adapter 4 is not showing me the detailed information that I'd like to see from it and it's causing me not to be able to get a heat map throughput as well. It looks like it's not connected at this point. So let's go and take a look at that again. It is connected so it's not showing up. This is my 11AC adapter. I've had some problems getting that adapter to work all the time with this and here we see it has finally showed up again. So here's my 11AC adapter. It's connected to an 11AC 5 gigahertz uh, connection. Here is my uh, uh, two different 2.4 gigahertz 11N adapters. One of them is a Proxim and one of them is an Edimax. And so we can see the connections. Now I'm really, really close to my access point. So I'm going to have great consistency in my pings and all of this kind of information. My signal strength is not really going to change much anywhere on my heat map or anywhere else. Um, so the point is that it's not going to adjust much. I'm not moving around, obviously. If, if this was a laptop and I was moving around, you'd be able to see that. Uh, you can see that we have uh, additional views here. So we have drops, which I only have drops for an adapter that is not actually connected, but the driver is in my system and it is a, a special tap driver. So uh, that's why that we're seeing that. But down here at the bottom are all of my actual adapters. They're not dropping anything at all. And if I go to my spectrogram, of course, I see that. And then I also have the option to just view all the charts at once so I can see my statistical average and standard deviation for my ping throughput. Uh, again, a very different take on what you might have in a type of Wi-Fi scanner tool. Uh, we're not going to capture any packets with this tool or anything like that. It's just going to show me this information. All right, so this is again NetSurveyor Professional. It's a free download, so you can download this tool. And uh, I've played around with it with several different adapters. Uh, it does work with internal Wi-Fi adapters on laptops and things like that as well. So it's definitely a useful tool for some analysis visually presented that you might not be able to see in a typical Wi-Fi scanner type of application. So that is Net Surveyor Professional. Now the next tool I want to look at here is Network Miner. Network Miner is a little different tool. You're mostly concerned about looking at your application traffic with this tool and trying to find out what's going on with your network. Uh, you know, problems with wireless networks are not always wireless, right? But I can come up here and choose my adapter if I want to. And I can actually capture off of, say, my uh, Edimax dual band adapter here, my AC1200 adapter. I can actually do live captures and pull in information. But for sake of time, what I'm going to do instead is open a PCAP file. And what you'll see is it begins processing the file. And it's literally going through the PCAP and learning everything it can about the devices that are in that PCAP file, including doing operating system identification and things of this sort. Not only is it doing operating system identification, it is also actually extracting out files and things like that 
that are actually inside of the PCAP. So for example, if someone downloaded a PDF file, you would actually be able to not only see that there's a PDF file in there, but right click on it and open it up and you can actually view the PDF file. So first of all, notice we have here a what looks like a Windows computer and you can see it says the OS is Windows and it uh, looks like they're thinking they're pretty sure it's XP Pro or Windows 2000 Pro. If we go down to host details, we can actually see some of the information that was gathered out of the PCAPs in order to understand what kind of system that might be. So it's looking at all kinds of factors, uh, time to live. It's looking at the kinds of queries it makes. It's looking at the web browser that it runs. It's looking at all this and then aggregating it together to try to figure out what that operating system might be. So it's a kind of OS footprinting concept that's built into the tool. So we can see that. I can see the incoming and outgoing sessions from that computer, what they've connected to, what ports they connected on, things of that sort. And so I can see that for every device that is found here. If I go to files, this is where I can actually see the uh, individual files that have been uh, acquired. So we see JavaScript files, HTML files. There's a JPEG image. I have no idea what it is, so I'm not going to open that up. And we have HTML files and so forth. But you can actually right click on a file and say open file. And if you notice, when you look in the URL where it opens the file, it's not opening from a website. It's actually opening the file that is part of the captured dump. So notice there's a folder here that is called Assembled Files. And it's literally assembled those files and it's showing it to me here. This particular HTML file is something to do with uh, Active Directory and not necessarily your typical uh, HTML file that you might see at a website. Here's a Flash document. We could open that and so forth. The point is that all of this is extracted and assembled for you. So for example, if I go to images, you can literally see the images and all of the images that are part of that capture file are displayed. Um, if I go to credentials, if there were any clear text credentials, they would show up here as well. And then I can see the individual sessions that took place, any DNS queries that happened, any parameters that were passed along a command line, or rather, in this case, usually HTTP, things like that. So here are get uh, parameters. Here's another get parameter and so forth. So all of that inside of this uh, capture. Again, this is a tool that you don't usually capture with. Uh, it's not the best at capturing, I've found. But if you capture with something else, then load it into this, it's going to break it all apart for you and show you all of the individual components. And Network Miner is uh, it's not very expensive because it's free. So it's a, a nice free tool that can get you some really good insights into the systems within that are seen within your PCAP files. And the nice thing is, you're actually looking at a point in time in the past of what files were accessed, what images, that kind of thing. It's all right there. And of course, if you open a smaller file, something that's uh, not quite so large, then it's going to load faster. And if you load a bigger file, this one here is called Big Flows, right? And this is just a sample file. You can find it online. If you search for bigflows.pcap and smallflows.pcap, you can download those to test tools like this and, and just have a, a pcap with a lot of different kinds of data in it. If I click open on that, you'll see it'll start processing and you can see it's at 0%. It's, it's adding all kinds of data. It's going to take a long, long time. So I'm just going to go ahead and stop that and not process that particular file. It'll take a long time, but it will process the entire file and then give you all of the information. So that's the network miner. Now we also have the device monitoring studio, which is an interesting tool as well to say the least. And when we go into it, it's going to give us a very different view of network analysis. Uh, now, first of all, if you purchase Device Monitoring Studio Ultimate Edition, uh, which is several hundred dollars, if you do purchase that, then you will then be able to do USB analysis, serial analysis, as well as network analysis. And you'll get all the features that right now I'm going to see some things, but they're actually just trial features without an actual purchase of the tool. So I can choose the adapter that I want to monitor on and simply because I'm actually not passing any data through my wireless adapters, I won't use them, but you can. I have used it to capture with these wireless adapters and you're going to end up looking at 
layer three through four mostly, not really seeing any Wi-Fi information. Uh, but let's just kind of see what this gives us. So if I right click on my ethernet adapter and start monitoring, then I can capture uh, raw data if I want to, structured view and statistics, and there are exporters that you can be running and things like that as well to export the data out. You can also do a custom view and you can modify how you want that to look. And then you simply click on start. And it's going to take it just a bit to begin monitoring, but we can see that it is monitoring now. And simply because I'm actually online on this Ethernet port, uh, streaming audio, streaming video, we're going to see continual traffic without actually having to make any traffic happen. So here I'm looking at my uh, traffic statistics and gathering all of that information. If I look at my structured view, then here I'm going to be seeing my uh, various Ethernet packets. And at any time, I can go into one of these packets, expand it out, and see what it is. I can see it's IPv4 and it's UDP. So given that it's IPv4 and it's UDP, I've got a pretty good idea that this is probably part of my stream. So we're actually seeing that information that is uh, being passed through. So this is the, the, the way it's displaying the Ethernet packets in this case, or it would be Wi-Fi packets if we were capturing on the Wi-Fi port, but it still shows Ethernet packets here when you're on Wi-Fi. So this analysis tool is not going to give you true wireless LAN frames. It's important to keep that in mind with it. Uh, you're going to be looking at pseudo Ethernet headers, and of course you're doing layer three and above analysis with it, but it will capture that information with your laptop it's not going to be a promiscuous capture in that way. So what I have found is when I want to do a promiscuous capture of Wi-Fi, I'll go ahead and capture that using my other tools, so whether that's ComView for Wi-Fi, OmniPeak, whatever it is, and then load it up in here as a PCAP file. And you can then do your analysis with that. And so here's my raw data. And you're literally going to see your raw data coming in. Uh, line by line as it comes into the network interface and so you can actually see what you would normally see in a hex view in a protocol analyzer we're seeing it here just in a stream which is the real way that it happens and so we have red for incoming and blue for outgoing and so this is the way it happens it's a stream it's not a, a, a file per se necessarily but the way your adapter sees it is more as a stream of one frame right after the other and so this view shows me the information in that form another feature this tool has is it does have the ability to build a packet so you can go in and build a new packet you can build art packets ip tcp udp uh, version 6 of dhcp and icmp dns llmnr uh, nbtns nbtss and, and a modbus tcp packet so i can actually go in and say well i want to create my own udp packet and you can see, you can expand it out and you can change the destination and address. Uh, the source address can be changed. So if I go in here, I can change this source address, for example, FFAAFFAA. And FFAA. And you can see that it sets that address. So now that I've changed that address, I can also go in and I could change, for example, my source and destination IP addresses. I could add any kind of data I want to with my UDP packet. I can change the source and destination port of my UDP packet. And once everything's done and I've got it all configured, then I can just come up here and click Send Packet. And I can choose how many I want to send. I'll just send five to not overload my Ethernet port. Click on Start and it sends the packets. And now if we go back to the structured view, we could actually find those packets in here. And they're going to be pretty small, but we could find these packets in here. They're around 60 uh, bytes in size is the size of those UDP packets. And I won't bother to search for them now, but we could because we still have more coming in and so we're getting a lot of traffic. At any time, of course, you can pause this. It'll stop capturing, and so you can see that uh, it's going to bring it to a halt, and now I can go back through and I can look at the history of all of my communications, 
and I still have all of my packets available to me. And I could search through those packets to try to find something that I'm looking for in particular. Here, for example, is a packet that is an Ethernet packet. And you can see the destination and the source MAC address. Now, since I know my MAC address, I could find and I could actually search for my specific MAC address that I created, right? Which was FA colon AA, FA, FF colon AA, FF colon AA. And I could search for that and see if I could find it in my packet list. And, um, and, and then I could pull it up in that way. So this tool, again, another tool, uh, the free version is going to let you do um, pretty much all that we've seen here. Uh, the paid version is going to add a lot of extra analysis capabilities and things like that and give you the ability to do USB and serial analysis and so forth. So keep in mind that there are extra features when you pay for those extra features with this particular tool. And again, this is called the Free Device Monitoring Studio. Acrylic Wi-Fi Professional is, is a tool that allows you to um, scan for Wi-Fi networks and see information about those networks. It's a little more powerful than most other Wi-Fi scanners though because with the right adapter it does give you the ability to actually capture your packets and, and see those packets at least to some extent. Now there are, it, it's not a perfect packet capture tool. Uh, sometimes I've noticed it might decode a little improperly in a few areas and it doesn't fully decode the packets but you can save it as a PCAP file and then open it up in Wireshark or another tool like that. So one of the things that I, I can do is come up to my uh, adapter interface and I can select the adapter that I want to use so I'll use my Edimax AC1200 and I can say OK and notice I do have monitor mode turned on and then I can also go over to my capture packet section and turn view packets on. So then when I click go, it's going to actually show me various packets as well as wireless networks if it's able to work with that adapter. So we come back over, we're not really getting anything here. Well, let's try something. Let's stop that. Let's go back in and let's change it to our other Edimax adapter. Make sure packet capture is on. And now we're getting information. So what you'll find is not every adapter is going to work the same as far as supporting monitor mode or not supporting monitor mode. So you have to be aware of that when you're looking at this particular tool. But they do have at their website a list of the different uh, adapters, how they work, some of them will give you radio tap headers, some of them will not, etc. So that information is provided at their website. Once I have a capture, I can actually go in and take a look, for example, at, um, say, this block acknowledgement that I have here. And I can go into the radio tap header and see the uh, signal strength the data rate. Uh, now my signal strength for uh, any kind of real data that might be transmitted is going to be very high because my adapters are 14 to 18 inches away from the actual access point so uh, it's very close by. Uh, here's my beacon frame and you can see the beacon frame at 9 megabits per second. Um, if we go into the actual frame itself you can see, for example, it says beacon interval is 100. Uh, it's actually wrong to say the beacon interval is 100 seconds. It would be close to say the beacon interval is 100 milliseconds. It's actually most accurate to say the beacon interval is 100 time units or 102.4 milliseconds. Uh, so this is where I said it might not decode everything perfectly, but it's, it's getting the raw data. This decode view is not the raw data. If we were to look over here at the raw data, you see the hex value for the beacon interval is 6400. And if you, you know about hex, you know the right position in the hex chunk is kind of a ones space that goes from 0 to F, F being 15, so 16 values. And then we have the 16 space where my 6 is here. So if I take 6 times 16, I come up with 
96, right? 96 plus 4 equals 100. So it's decoding it right to be 100. It's interpreting it wrong when it says that it's 100 seconds because it's certainly not 100 seconds. If the beacon interval was 100 seconds, that would cause some major problems for your network. So uh, there are some issues like that in the actual view with the tool, uh, but this is something that they'll work on and repair rather quickly, I'm sure. I notified them of it. I literally only noticed earlier today that this beacon interval was not interpreted correctly, and I've let them know about it. I'm sure it'll be fixed in an update very, very shortly. Uh, but what we can do is we can actually save this out as a PCAP file. So I can say stop instead of pause and then go to PCAP and save PCAP. And we can put it on the desktop. And so now I have a PCAP file that I could open in some other tool. So I can close this down and maybe I want to look at that in Wireshark. Now I have noticed Wireshark sees some malformed packet information in the PCAPs that are created from acrylic. So let's just go ahead and open that up and take a look at it. And uh, so when we take a look here, uh, here's my beacon frame. And if I open it up, well, and it looks like this time I'm not actually getting the malform packet warning from that one. But at any rate, we can see that in here, when we look at our beacon frame, and our fixed parameters, notice there's nothing wrong in the data that's actually captured by acrylic. It's just capturing the frame. It's all about decoding and interpretation, right? So what we see here is that that exact same uh, information, and this is the same beacon frame from the same, maybe not the same beacon frame, but a beacon frame from the same AP, and you can see that it's uh, uh, 0 0.102400 seconds or 102.4 milliseconds, okay? So this one is giving us uh, more accurate information about what that beacon interval is. But what it's doing is, notice what Wireshark is doing? It's taking the time unit because the, the value is 64. The value is not something that would equal 102400, is it? So Wireshark is going further. It's not just decoding it and saying beacon interval colon 100. It's interpreting it for you to an actual time value based on the fact that it's 100 time units. Okay, so that's what we're actually seeing here in this decode with Wireshark. Uh, but again, you can see looking through that we do have in the capture from that tool, we have various RTS, CTS, we have some block acknowledgements. Um, we don't have a whole lot of data frames, and that's just because I'm not really doing a lot of transmission on that channel. I'm not doing any transmission on that channel at this time, so um, nothing significant happening from my device. We're picking up some things from other devices, however. Let's go into our virtual machine, and rather than run it full screen, just to remind you that we're looking at a virtual machine, I'm going to stay right here uh, in my Ubuntu virtual machine. And a couple things we want to look at here. So first of all, uh, the cap analysis tool. Again, you can install cap analysis on your local system. And if you uh, download it, uh, the file you're going to download is cap analysis underscore 1.2.2 underscore amd64.deb or whatever your processor package is. Um, so you can download that and then install it as a package and you can run it locally. What I'm going to do now is go ahead and go to capanalysis.net and I have actually preloaded here a data set just so there's something in here to look at. And it's that same small flows PCAP that we looked at actually with uh, NetMiner. And so when I go into this information here, you can actually see my PCAP file. So if I go to my data set then and I click right here on the data set, you're going to get the information. So first of all, you're going to see a tab for flows. And this is all of the flows of the communications that are seen in the PCAP file. And you can next your way through these. You can also jump specifically to a particular page. It's going to show me, for example, the bytes sent, the bytes received in the flow, the percent of this total PCAP file that that flow makes up, packets sent, packets received, and the duration. You can see the protocols, DNS, SSL, HTTP, and so forth, all of that is there. If we go to overview, we're going to get a nice graphical overview. So we can see our flows, 
we can see uh, information about data and duration. So we've got various uh, values here that we can see. You have down here the protocols uh, versus countries. And you can actually move these around if you want to. So I can click and drag to reposition these in some way if I desire to. And give myself a little bit of a different view. So you've got protocols. You can get flows. Uh, or you can look at the actual data, like so. And protocol versus days, flows, or again, data. And up here, again, I can be looking at flows, sent, received, total data, or just duration values. I can look at my duration values, my data, or my flows. So there's several ways you can view information here on the overview. When you go to statistics, you're going to see source IP versus flows, which kind of gives you a hint of what IP address has more flows. Uh, we can see here uh, the purple background is bytes received, the red is bytes sent. So I can see for that 192.168.3.131, while it may have a lot of flows, I can see the actual amount of data. So less than one megabyte sent, but we can see uh, about seven megabytes received. I can see destination IP versus data sent and received, destination IP versus flows, protocols versus flows, country versus flows, and then here I have my duration versus flow, so how long it took for those flows to complete. You can view the information per hour. Of course, everything in this capture happened within a one hour period. There's geo mapping capabilities built into the tool. So I can actually see my flows by country. And so if I hover over uh, a country, it's going to show me the number of flows, the amount of data sent and received. Um, I can see instead data and uh, I can see that as well. Now it's still going to give me the same thing when I hover over it, but it's going to change my scale here and what I'm actually looking at. So I can see received, I can see sent, and so forth. So all of this is available to me here within the GeoMap. If I go to my IP sources, I can see the different IP addresses and uh, the flows they were involved in and by sent. But now what it gives me the ability to do too is click and kind of zoom in on the details. So I can come in and look at flows, data, data in and data out. And I can also come down here and look at flows, data, data in and data out. I can do it as source, as destination, based on connections. So I can actually see connections and where they're targeted. I can do it based on the timeline, which my timeline is not long in this PCAP file, so not a lot of information there. And it will also do who is lookups for me as well. Here's my IP destinations that I can evaluate by. And the same thing, I can click on it and then see evaluations based on the destination. And then I can see my protocols. So here's my HTTP protocol. Here's HTTP with MSN. Here's my SSL communications. Over here, notice I've got some Skype communications going on and I can actually see IP source and IP destinations involved in Skype calls and how much data there was and how many flows were involved. All of that is available to me here. And then of course, there's just my timeline view in general. Okay, so that is what CAP analysis does for me. You can see it's a very useful tool, again, for overall network performance analysis, which still applies to our wireless networks. We can't forget the rest of the stack. Um, I was watching a, a Shark Fest presentation that I thought of while thinking about this webinar today, some time back, and um, it was rather interesting. He was pointing out that poor old TCP gets ignored, so you've got your programmers that work at layers uh, uh, five, six, and seven. You've got your network engineers that work at layers three, two, and one, and everybody ignores TCP, which is often a very defining layer as to where the problem is. So uh, it, very interesting stuff there. We've got to remember those other layers, even when we're doing troubleshooting of wireless networks and so forth. Now what we want to do is take a look at another tool here. So we're going to go to the console for this, and I will enlarge my console just a bit. And we're going to look at Scappy. You may have used it before. It's a, a nifty little tool that you'll want to spend just hours playing around in to find out what all kinds of wireless information it can give you. You can run it on Windows too, but you're not going to get your radio tap information right and things like that. So it's best on, on the Linux platform or possibly uh, on a Mac OS uh, distribution. So uh, what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to go into root mode and I don't want to have to uh, sudo everything. So I'm going to cheat, sudo bash, put in my password. And now what I can do is run iwconfig. And let's see if we've got any wireless adapters. We do not. So I'm going to go and connect one. And I'll go ahead and connect my, 
Well, we'll just go ahead and connect the Orinoco. Why not? And now that we've connected our adapter, let's run IWconfig again. And you'll notice that we do actually have our adapter now. So now that I have my adapter, I can run Airmon NG, put it into monitor mode. And I could put it on a specific channel, for example, channel 6, and say that that's the channel that I want to watch. And IW config again, and you can see that I actually do now have a monitor right here, uh, 11 ABGN. So uh, just want you to see what uh, Scappy can actually do for you. Now what I'm going to do first is show you a script that I put together to uh, demonstrate this. And actually, you know, if you try to duplicate this, uh, I want you to be able to. So let me do this. Let me instead go to user bin. And this is where you want to place the file. So after you install Scappy, if you want to do a script file, something like this, you want to place it with Scappy. And Scappy is here in the bin folder. So I'm going to edit it here. And it's a, it's a Py file, so it's Python. And I'll go ahead and open that up. And here you can just see the, uh, the actual script that I threw together. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm starting by importing Scappy modules. And then we're defining basically a, a function here, uh, a packet handler. And uh, we're going to check to see if it's 802.11. Uh, then we're going to look at the type of frame that it is. Okay, so we're looking at that. And then if it has .11 beacon um, uh, or it has the .11 probe response, either one. So we're wanting to find out the signal strength of the AP, and we're going to do that by looking at beacon frames or probe response frames. So what we're going to do is say um, is, is the packet is not decoded. There's part of the packet that's not decoded automatically by Scappy, and we're going to convert that with this algorithm. And you can find online the different ways that you can decode the undecoded parts of the Scappy headers. And then uh, if there's an exception, we'll just say it's negative 100. So if you were to run this script and the output was negative 100 for everything, then that's telling you that it was unable to properly decode the radio tap header. And then what does the function do? Well, it just prints out signal uh, colon and then the RSSI and then the word DBM and then the actual SSID. Okay, so then we, after we have the function built, we're going to use sniff, which is a built-in function in Scappy to sniff on interface mon0, which we just started. And we'll do 250 uh, packets, either probe responses or beacons. And uh, that's what we're going to do. So that's what the actual script looks like. So now let's go ahead and run Scappy. And what I'm going to do is just say import Scappy underscore beacon strength. And when we run that, if we type import properly, <laughs> need to type beacon properly too, don't we? And then we'll run that, and there we go. So it's just going to do 250 iterations. And every now and then, there might be some odd things you'll see. That can happen for different reasons. But when you see it really bad like this with Scappy, it's usually something about that packet didn't get decoded right. Um, it is in a neg 80 dBm. So you'd think we'd be able to decode it appropriately. But um, at any rate, that's generally why that is there. But you can see, uh, so for example, right here is my uh, access point, neg 38 dBm. Uh, and it's on channel 6 there, so that's why it's showing up. We've got one called Mommy 14, Neg 79, CenturyLink 4123, Neg 69, Bernice, Neg 66, Bees in the Trap, 78, and so forth. So these are all the different SSIDs that can be seen on channel 6 from my location. So all I have to do is I can exit out of here with the control D, or you can type exit opening closing parens. Um, I can say Airmon NG stop mon0 and then what we'll do is we will start WLAN0 but this time put it on channel 11 and go back into Scappy again and we'll import Scappy underscore beacon strength and off it goes um, something did not change in the channel did it so we're still seeing uh, JND24, 
So interestingly, it did not accept my channel change. I always forget that there's an opening and closing prints there. Let's do an IW config. And it looks like it's not reporting any channel to me. So it's requiring my application to change the channel. So there's a couple things I could do. One thing I could do to force a change in channel is instead of using Airmon NG, I could actually change my script to use WLAN 0. And I could just put WLAN 0 in monitor mode and then set the channel on that if my adapter allows me. So some adapters in Linux you can, some you cannot. You have to play around with your adapter to see if it's one that you can actually modify in that way. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind. You might need to change it in that way to get it to work. Um, getting Wi-Fi adapters to work consistently in Linux uh, is just a near impossibility. It's going to be different depending on the adapter you're using. Some of them you can change the channel with uh, IW config and it works. Some of them you can change it with Airmon NG and it works every time. Uh, some of them you have to use IW dev in order to change it. So it it's all comes down to the drivers and how they like to be talked to is really what it amounts to. Uh, for example, I was able to get an 802.11ac adapter to um, partially function in Linux and it was actually the Netgear A6200 not the 6210 the Netgear A6200 uh, but when I am able to get it to work I can't really put it in monitor mode it goes into auto mode if you try to set it to monitor and then you can do uh, packet capture with it but it doesn't allow you to change channels it doesn't allow you to change channel bandwidth or any of those things so it's still a bit of a struggle to get 802.11 AC USB adapters working properly in most Linux distributions today it just doesn't have the kernel hooks that it actually needs right now okay now for sake of time because we've seen um, network miner on the Windows side. I'm not going to spend a lot of time showing it here, but what I am going to do is jump over to the folder where it's installed. And you can find online where you get the uh, sources to install it on Linux. Okay, so my network is Network Miner. And, or my folder rather. And I just run networkminer.exe. But if I run that, notice it says command not found. Even if I add the .exe, command not found. But I'm looking at it. Well, remember, I'm on Linux. I'm not on Windows anymore. So I need to use a tool called Mono, which the instructions for installing Network Miner on Linux that you'll find uh, around the internet. Uh, do actually tell you you've got to use mono. And now you can see that it'll open up. And I could, just as I did on Windows, I could open up a uh, PCAP file and process it. So I'm not going to do that in this case for sake of time. We'll just go ahead and exit out of here. So now then finally, the last thing I want to show you before we wrap up today and then open it for Q&A is uh, Nuts About Nets. And as we, we've all heard of YSpy DBX, um, uh, Spectrum XT from Air Magnet, and those are going to be more accurate tools than these, but there's some pretty interesting things and some capabilities that in a lot of scenarios, it's all you need that make these inexpensive tools rather interesting as a choice. So you can actually see one of them right here. This is the RF Explorer Handheld Spectrum Analyzer. And uh, this tool is just what it says. It's a handheld spectrum analyzer, but it's actually more than that. So for example, if I go into products, all products, and then I choose RF Explorer, the first thing to note is there are different versions of RX, RF Explorer. Okay, so you've got them that cover different frequency ranges. Um, RF Explorer 6G combo is going to give you uh, everything you need for 11AC, 11A, 11N, and 5 gigahertz monitoring, but it's not going to give you your uh, monitoring for uh, 2.4 gigahertz that you're probably going to want to have. Uh, well, it actually can, but at any rate, I find that uh, the best tool out here is the RF Explorer Wi-Fi Combo. Now, one benefit of the 6G is look how low it does go. You could potentially use it in 
analysis of 802.11ah, for example, if we eventually begin to see those devices. But what we see here is the, the, the primary one for today's Wi-Fi is the RF Explorer Wi-Fi combo. And you can see it's going to cover your 2.4 and your 5 gigahertz in that case. Um, and so that's going to give you the information that you need. And if you take a look then at what it does, it's first of all, it's got a handheld LCD where you can actually see the spectrum activity just on your screen as you walk around, which is a very nice feature for such a low cost tool. But it also will connect to your laptop where you can use tools to gather data from it and view your spectrum trace on your laptop. And uh, one of the reasons why it's so appealing is right here. So you can see it's $270 for the Wi-Fi combo version, which is going to allow you to scan all through. Now here's where the difference is. It's in your frequency resolution, uh, your noise levels, uh, the filtering that it has, things like that are going to make it not as accurate as some other spectrum analyzers. But for a low cost tool, there's no question that it can be very useful. Now we also see the 6G then, not all that much more expensive. So if you wanted to just go ahead and jump to it, then you could get that device and you're going to cover the lower frequencies uh, as well as 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So all of that's going to be covered. There is software available too that you can get for use with that particular device. And so you'll notice right here, Wi-Fi Surveyor software, it's $49. And uh, the software is pictured here, but if we scroll down, you can see the actual screenshots of what it looks like. Of course, they're showing it on a Surface Pro, which is a great way to demonstrate it, really. Uh, a lot of people use those for uh, surveys today. So here we see our spectrum trace data. Here's our waterfall. Here's our topographic map, a delta trace. Here's the threshold trace, a uh, channel heat map for all the channels. Uh, channel spectrogram, and that might look familiar to you, very similar to what we saw in uh, Net Surveyor Professional because the same company makes it. Uh, here's the channel density, uh, the time course, so over time seeing what's happening, our AP grid that we can actually see as well in the tool, uh, network discovery features that are common to tools such as this, uh, AP time course, AP differential, occupied channels, and they've got different levels of, of utilization. Channel time course, there's a channel heat map, uh, channel spectrogram, network discovery, there's data logging. As you can see, it goes on. It even has the ability to export it out to an Excel spreadsheet where they automatically color and create for you a heat map within Microsoft Excel. So I found that to be an interesting oddity as I was exploring the tools. So this is a tool set that may very well be worth considering if you're on a budget and you've been unable to get your hands on a good spectrum analyzer that you want to use on a regular basis.